This presentation is called, What is the Iterated Prisoner's Dilemma? And in it, we're going to answer three questions. What is the Iterated Prisoner's Dilemma? What is tit for tat? And what is an evolutionarily stable strategy? So we've noted this quote from Ken Binmore earlier that the prisoner's dilemma represents a situation in which the dicer is loaded against cooperation as they possibly could be. And in discussing the prisoner's dilemma in this manner, he's talking about what's called the one-shot prisoner's dilemma. That there's more than one prisoner's dilemma game on the one hand, we have the one-shot game that we've looked at, where Binmore writes that in the great, if in the great game of life were the one-shot prisoner's dilemma, we wouldn't have evolved as social animals. And then we have the repeated game, and it appears that repeating the game allows us to change those outcomes. So repetition changes everything. And this is what we're going to focus on in this presentation, is what's called the iterated prisoner's dilemma. So what is an iterated game or an iterated prisoner's dilemma? It, iterated simply means repeated. So when we're talking about the iterated prisoner's dilemma, we're talking about the game played over and over. And as we'll see in another presentation, how many times we expect the game to be repeated is terribly important in shaping our behavior. The key contributors to the iterated prisoner's dilemma are Robert Axelrod, a political scientist who put together a prisoner's dilemma tournament in the late 1970s, and of course, uh, William D. Hamilton, who we've already met, who co-authored the evolution of cooperation with Axelrod First, they published a paper in the journal Science in 1981, and then this book came out in 1984, and Hamilton is credited as the co-author of Chapter 5, which relates this to evolutionary biology. But I think that Hamilton probably had some influence on the entire evolutionary argument of the book, and evolution may not have been in the title if it hadn't been for Hamilton's influence. So the matrix of the iterated prisoner's dilemma is exactly the same matrix that we've been looking at. So we've talked about the prisoner's dilemma in several ways, as a card game, as a donation game, and in the classic model. And in all of those, we have the same matrix. And so nothing there has changed. We will follow a standard usage and refer to the options of the two players as being to cooperate or to defect. But the payouts are the same and the expectations are the same. But instead of just two players who play once, imagine that there's lots of players. So out here, let's say that we have a player that we'll call red and a player that we call blue and they might run into each other, and when they do, they play an episode or a hand of the prisoner's dilemma. We also have the green player and the orange player, and we can imagine lots of players out there, and each time they meet, uh, they play the prisoner's dilemma. And it turns out to be very important how likely it is that they'll meet again when they play that. So what... Uh, Robert Axelrod did, computers were just coming into their own at the level at which they could be owned and afforded by university faculty. And he organized a tournament where mathematicians and economists and others submitted versions or submitted players that had certain strategies coded in them. And then he observed how well different strategies did against one another. So an important point is that in this tournament, strategies replace players. Another way that we might put that is that players are strategies. And what do we mean by that? Well, an example is that in the game, one strategy is called all see. 
and that means always cooperate. And another strategy is called all D, and that means always defect. So instead of these players choosing between strategies based on the game, they simply play this strategy over and over. And all C and all D are examples of what are called unconditional strategies. An unconditional strategy means that the players that are coded with that make the same play without regard to what the other player does. And all C is an example of an other focus strategy that we discussed earlier. No matter what the other players do, all C chooses cooperate, and that means that unless all C is going to meet another player that chooses to cooperate, all C is going to behave altruistically. And so we can certainly run that strategy, but the question is, can that strategy survive and can, could it evolve if it's playing a tournament with other players who don't always choose to cooperate? Another strategy that became the most famous one in the tournament is called tit for tat. And this is what's known as a conditional strategy. And what does that mean? It means that it doesn't simply have one strategy, but its strategy depends upon what the other player does in the prior encounter. So on the first move, tit for tat always cooperates. And if tit for tat meets all C, they're both going to cooperate and it'll be hard to tell them apart. And then on the second move, tit for tat repeats whatever it its opponent did on the first move. So if tit for tat meets all D, that means that tit for tat is going to cooperate and all D is going to defect. And that'll be the first time they meet each other. But the second time they meet each other, then tit for tat will also defect. So let's work through this a little more systematically and tally up some outcomes. So if an all C player meets another all C player, they're both going to cooperate. And that means their outcome is going to be four offspring. And remember that the pay up, payoff matrix is the same as we've been using in the other games. On the other hand, if all D meets an all D, then they're both going to defect on one another. And that means their payout will be two offspring. And that's the difference between the cooperative corner that all C will land in and the spiteful corner that all D will land in. And who has the higher reproductive success? Well, as long as all C is just meeting other players that play all C, and all D is simply meeting other players that play all D, of course all C is going to have the highest reproductive success. And how do we know that? Again, let's think back to this game uh, where we have a row and a column player if all C represents players who always cooperate, they get two plus two points, whereas all D represents players that always defect, and so they get one plus one. And that's where we get the four and the two from. Now what happens though when an all D player meets an all C player? This means that the row player, if that's all C, cooperates and the column player defects. And we've looked at this before. When that happens, cooperation plus defection means that all of the points shift to all D. All D earns three points, and all C earns nothing. So it's a very bad day for all C when it plays the game against all D. And if we ask, uh, what happens if all C continually meets all D? Well, then what's going to happen in terms of the hands is that all D is continually going to rack up three points, whereas all C is going to continually rack up no points. And if we ask now who has the higher reproductive success, it's going to be all D. And indeed, it would appear that if our community is made up of some players who play all D and others who always cooperate, 
those all D players are going to displace the cooperators. So let's imagine this world. It has one all C player and that all C player is surrounded by all D players. So we have a cooperator surrounded by defectors and we can say what's going to happen to that cooperator because no matter who they interact with it's going to be a defector and that means that they're going to rack up no offspring and the defectors are going to exploit them and what will happen to all C? We'd expect all C to go extinct in short order and for all C to no longer be part of the social universe. And this allows us to define what an evolutionarily stable strategy is. If the social universe is made up of just two strategies, all C and all D, so some players always cooperate and others always defect, then all D will dominate and that means that alone all C cannot possibly invade. So again, if we imagine that we have this social universe where everyone is an all D strategist except for one all C who shows up, that all C player won't be able to get a foothold. And if we imagine this is a genetic mutation that produces this one cooperator, we expect that it won't spread and it won't survive very long. And what this tells us then is that all D in this universe is what's called an evolutionarily stable strategy. And this means that it cannot be invaded by all C. So let's define that again. What is an evolutionarily stable strategy? It's a strategy that once it's established so that it dominates that social universe, it cannot be invaded by a lone mutant that plays a different strategy. And always defect is an evolutionarily stable strategy with relation to always cooperate. Always cooperate simply cannot invade a universe that's populated with defectors. And this idea of the evolutionary stable strategy, uh, the term was coined by an evolutionary biologist named John Maynard Smith. So imagine this world, instead of a world that's made up of defectors uh, where all C tries to invade, imagine that the world is made up of cooperators and a defector tries to invade. What's going to happen to always defect when it enters this universe of cooperators? Well, for a while, it's going to be a very easy pickings for that defector because whichever cooperator they play the game with and interact with, the cooperator is going to get zero offspring and they're going to get three. So we did, would expect uh, that the universe would slowly start turning uh, from green to red. And in fact, it would start out very rapidly turning from green to red and then that would slow down. And that's because the answer depends on the frequency of encounters. And we'll come back to this, but as you get more defectors, they're more and more likely to bump into each other, in which case they're only going to earn one offspring apiece. And if those cooperators can somehow segregate themselves from the defectors, they can keep earning four points per round. Um, but each time that a defector interacts with the cooperator, uh, they're going to shut down their reproductive success. And so we do expect that all D can invade a universe of cooperators. And that means that with regard to always defect, always cooperate is not an evolutionarily stable strategy. So we've looked at what happens when always cooperate meets always defect, but what happens when always cooperate meets tit for tat? Well, we know that on its first play, tit for tat always cooperates, and then it does whatever the other strategy does. And this means that the first time they meet, they will both cooperate and they'll each get two points. But then because always cooperate cooperated on the first encounter, tit for tat will continue to cooperate. And in fact, they'll just continue cooperating as if they were both all C players. So they'll continue to earn the maximum number of points.
And if they meet repeatedly, what we'll see is that they have equal reproductive success. They'll both pick up two offspring per game. So tit for tat, when it meets always cooperate, is indistinguishable from always cooperate. It appears to be the same strategy. And what's the difference then that makes tit for tat so famous? Well, that has to do with what happens when tit for tat meets always defect. So what happens when they meet? Well, on the first play, tit for tat is going to cooperate and the outcome is going to be the same as when always defect meets always cooperate. And that means that tit for tat is going to get zero offspring and always defect is going to get three. But on their second encounter, tit for tat is going to switch to defect and that's because always defect defected on their last encounter. And this means that the second time they meet, it will be just as if always defect is playing against another always defect. And they will each get one offspring. And this is the advantage then that tit for tat has over always cooperate. It does indeed lose on the first round whenever it encounters always defect. But then on each succeeding round, it breaks even with always defect, and that allows it to both invade an environment, a social universe of always defect, and also to hold its ground against always defect. So if we imagine a world uh, where all, tit for tat is surrounded by always defect, um, tit for tat is going to lose on the first round, but then it's going to pick up on succeeding rounds it's going to break even with always defect. But what if tit for tat can meet another tit for tat? Well, then they're both going to cooperate. And this means that tit for tat will pick up four points per round. Those two players, whereas the always defect will pick up just two. And tit for tat should gradually be able to establish a toehold in the universe of always defect. The key is that there has to be more than one tit-for-tat player, and those tit-for-tat players have to be able to find one another. So let's conclude with two key insights. We've defined what tit-for-tat is, what an evolutionarily stable strategy is, and what an iterated prisoner's dilemma is. We're going to be coming back to this topic and two things to note here then are that the possibilities for cooperation first depend on who your neighbors are. So if you're a always cooperator and you live in a neighborhood of defectors, you're not going to be able to get cooperation off the ground. On the other hand, if you live in a neighborhood of cooperators, you will. The second thing is that the possibilities for cooperation evolving also depend on the likelihood that you will interact with your neighbors. So if you can locate cooperative neighbors and interact with them, then cooperation can take off. If you can avoid defectors, you can avoid uh, losing out to them. And it turns out that the structure of communities is very important for the evolution of cooperation. Thank you for listening.